على مصر مين يبعت سلامك كميتين يا غلا الله مش تقلي بس الطيبين ودي يا ما فيها مخلصين يا ما شاء الله أصغر العلماء تقدر تقول ما تشاهد أنا الله أدعي لهم رب السماء بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم أخرجنا من ظلمات الوهم وأكرمنا بنور الفهم وافتح علينا بمعرفة العلم وحسن أخلاقنا بالحلم وجعلنا ممن يستمعون القول فيتبعون أحسنه اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سهلا رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما وصل اللهم وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين إن شاء الله This is the first in a series of lessons in which we will talk about an introduction to the madhab or the school of Al-Imam Al-Shafi'i رحمه الله تعالى This series of, of lessons is supposed to be a guide to a student who wishes to pursue uh, studies in the school of Imam al-Shafi'i. And there are two primary objectives that we seek to achieve through these lessons. The first of these is we would like to give a synopsis of the Shafi'i school. We would like to talk about its unique features, the historical development of the school, some of the major scholars in the school, some of the major books, and some of the most important terminology as well. And then the second objective that we would like to achieve ta'ala, is that we would like to introduce the book called Minhaj al-Talibin which is the primary book for fatwa in the Shafi'i school. And this book is also the curriculum for Shafi'i students at Al-Azhar University, in particular in the College of Sharia. So inshallah, let me give you a brief overview first of what we're going to be talking about and then we will go into details. Uh, there are seven major things that we want to talk about in this series, insha'Allah. The first thing that we will do is we will talk about some of the unique features of the Shafi'i school. Features that may also be found in some of the other schools, but somehow they're more pronounced for the Shafi'i school. So that's the first thing we want to talk about. The second thing that we want to talk about is the life of Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala. Then number three, we would like to talk about the development of the Shafi'i school after Imam al-Shafi'i all the way until the previous century, which is the 14th century Hijri. Then number four, uh, we would like to talk about what's called the golden chain of the Shafi'i school, which primarily means the chain starting from Imam al-Shafi'i and then his student, al-Muzani, followed by his student, Imam al-Haramain, or not his student directly, but a few, few uh, centuries later, Imam al-Haramain, or Imam al-Juwaini, followed by Imam al-Ghazali, followed by Imam al-Rafi'i, and then finally ending with al-Imam al-Nawawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, wa rahimahum ajma'in. So this chain, Shafi'i, Muzani, Imam al-Haramain, Ghazali, Rafi'i, Nawawi. This is sometimes referred to as a golden chain. So we would like to talk about this chain and the scholars that are in this chain, insha'Allah. Then number five, after this we would like to talk about Imam al-Nawawi's book, Minhaj al-Talibin, which as I said is the primary book for fatwa in the Shafi'i school. 
Uh, it has been for a long time, and it is also the book that is taught as the curriculum of, of uh, Al-Azhar University to Shafi'i students. Then number six, we would like to actually read the introduction of Minhaj al-Talibin and explain some of the things that are in there. And finally, the last thing that we would do to end the series is talk about the traditional curriculum of a Shafi'i student. Uh, the books that a Shafi'i student usually studies. Uh, there's a series of books that one studies as part of the curriculum of a Shafi'i student. So, to begin, inshallah, the first thing that we want to talk about is some of the unique features of the Shafi'i school. And the first thing that I would like to point out, which was pointed out to me by some of my teachers as well, is the Shafi'i school has a strong emphasis on textual evidence. And this is something unique about the Shafi'i school. So for example, starting from the very beginning, the founder of the school, which is Imam Shafi'i, the school has emphasized even a solitary report, a khabar ahad, a solitary report coming from the Prophet wasallam over something like amal of Ahl al-Madinah, which is contrary to the Maliki school. So in the Shafi'i school, it doesn't matter what a community is used to doing. It doesn't matter whether the people of Medina do certain things in a certain way. If there is a hadith sahih, if there is a sound hadith, an authentic report from the Prophet wasallam, even if it, if it comes from a solitary chain of narrators, that hadith, that report is given precedence over what a community does. Even if that community resides in the city of the Prophet wasallam, and even if that community comprises of people that are only one or two generations away from the Prophet ﷺ. And the same thing applies to any other Muslim community, whether it's in Kufa, or Basra, or Baghdad, or other parts of the Muslim world. If we have a solitary report, but it's authentic, going back to the Prophet ﷺ, then the Shafi'i school will prefer that over the uh, practice of any community, no matter what it may be. So emphasis on textual evidence is something very unique and it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hallmark of the Shafi'i school. Similarly, the Shafi'i school gives precedence to solitary reports, akhbar ahad, over qiyas or analogy or legal reasoning. The Shafi'i, Imam Shafi'i himself and his students after him would give preference to an authentic report, even if it's a solitary report, with a single chain of narrators over qiyas, or legal reasoning. And then also give it preference over qawlu sahabi which is basically the opinion of a companion of the Prophet So if we have an issue on which the, a companion of the Prophet Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, any of them, if they have an opinion about a particular issue. And on the other hand, we have a hadith, sahih, an authentic hadith that gives a different ruling or seems to give a different ruling than what the companion says. And the chain going back to the Prophet ﷺ for that hadith is authentic and sound, then the Shafi'i school would prefer this hadith over the opinion of a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. Not only that, but it would even prefer legal reasoning. Imam Shafi'i would prefer legal reasoning, what's called qiyas, analogical reasoning, over the opinion of a Sahabi. So if we have an issue on which there is no text from the Prophet ﷺ, but there is an opinion of a companion of the Prophet ﷺ, not something that all the companions unanimously agreed on, no, but we have an opinion attributed to a companion of the Prophet ﷺ. 
Imam al-Shafi'i will prefer his own scholarly reasoning over blindly following the opinion of the companion of the Prophet And this is something in which other schools have a different approach. So this is a hallmark of the Shafi'i school, giving preference and precedence to textual evidence over anything else and then to legal reasoning or analogical reasoning qiyas over the statement or opinion of a companion of the Prophet And because of this emphasis of Imam al-Shafi'i on hadith, on the sunnah, on textual evidence, a result of that, as a result of that, some of the most famous hadith scholars were students of Imam Shafi'i or students of his students. Al-Bukhari, Imam Muslim, Abu Dawood, Tirmidhi, Ibn Majah, and Nasai, the authors of the six famous books of hadith were all students of the students of Imam Shafi'i. Because Imam Shafi'i encouraged and emphasized on following the authentic sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, his students did the same. And therefore, due to this encouragement then, people like Bukhari and Muslim went out in search of ahadith and were inspired to search and compile books of authentic ahadith going back to the Prophet wasallam. So this is something that is a hallmark of Imam Shafi'i himself as an individual and his school as a whole. Emphasis on textual evidence. Another unique feature of the Shafi'i school is that it emphasizes what's called in Arabic ihtiyat or precaution, especially when it comes to devotional matters. So there we see, we find this all over uh, the various chapters of fiqh in the books of Shafi'i school that things are considered recommended or things are considered makruh because we want to be precautious we want to be safe and this is an overriding theme that comes up again and again in the books of Shafi'i school so even if that leads sometimes to some difficulty we are better safe than sorry as it said we'd rather be safe than sorry so even if it leads to a little bit of difficulty not undue hardship but a little bit of difficulty ihtiyat or precaution is preferred over relieving difficulty so this is something that's also a hallmark of the Shafi'i school another thing that's a unique feature of the Shafi'i school is that this school has produced a number of mujtahid imams a number of mujtahid imams at an early stage as well as later stages so for example i'll just give you a list of a few scholars that started out as shafi'is that were shafi'i in their upbringing in their in their preliminary learning but then eventually they Became, they, they reached the level of ijtihad and they would exercise their own independent legal reasoning, independent ijtihad, and sometimes arrive at conclusions that are different from the conclusions of Imam al Shafi'i. For example, the student of al Shafi'i himself, Imam al Muzani, rahimahullah, uh, uh, Imam ibn al Mundir, the author of, the, of uh, many of the famous books, ibn al Mundir. Also Abu Ja'far al-Tabari, or also called Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, the author of the famous Tafsir. Uh, he was also initially a Shafi'i, but then later on became a Mujtahid in his own right. Uh, Izzuddin ibn Abd salam also referred to as Sultan al-Ulama. He was also initially a Shafi'i and then eventually became a Mujtahid. Imam Ibn Daqiq al-Eid, another scholar who started out as a Shafi'i and then became an independent mujtahid. Imam al-Subki, Taqiyuddin al-Subki, also the same thing. And Imam al-Suyuti as well. So these and many other scholars are products of the Shafi'i school. The Shafi'i school encourages people, encourages people who have the qualifications of ijtihad to perform ijtihad and this is clearly shown in the lives of these great luminaries that I mentioned. 
And there are reasons for this. There are reasons why so many mujtahids have come out of the, uh, the Shafi'i school. One of the reasons is that Imam Shafi'i, when he taught and when he wrote books, he didn't just write books in fiqh showing you the masail, showing you this is haram, this is halal, this is mubah, this is makruh. He didn't just pronounce judgments on things and left it at that. His books are always coupled between evidences and rulings. Evidences and rulings. So for example, take, take Kitab al-Um, uh, probably the biggest work in fiqh left behind by Imam al-Shafi'i. In this book, Imam al-Shafi'i will present an ayah of the Qur'an or a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and then he will deduce rulings out of these textual evidences. So what he leaves behind in his books is not just judgments, but he teaches and shows how he performs ijtihad. So even through his books and in his, in his circles as well when he used to teach, he would teach his students how to arrive at judgments and rulings and ahkam. So from the very beginning in his teachings and in his books, he would encourage ijtihad and his ijtihad was transparent. His ijtihad was transparent. When somebody looks at Imam al-Shafi'i's books, he can not only see what his opinions were, but how he arrived at those opinions. And this is something unique about Imam al-Shafi'i. You don't always find this in other madahib, where oftentimes we have the opinions of the Imams, but we don't have a record of how they arrived at those opinions. Imam Shafi'i wasn't like that. And therefore, because his ijtihad was transparent, it, was also, it also gave a methodology that was reproducible or replicable, such that his students were then able to exercise ijtihad and the students of his students. Also, Imam Shafi'i very explicitly encouraged ijtihad and discouraged taqlid. He discouraged blind following, as is evident from the writings of his students, in particular Imam Al-Muzani rahimahullah ta'ala. So these are some of the unique features of the Shafi'i school. Let me mention a couple more. Um, the Shafi'i school is rich when it comes to various opinions or multiple opinions on issues. Imam Shafi'i himself had multiple opinions on many different issues. He's known to hold one opinion at one time, but then change his opinion at a different time. His books also that have reached us on many issues contain multiple opinions on different issues. Sometimes his students would have a different opinion from Imam Shafi'i himself. And sometimes there would be issues on which Imam Shafi'i doesn't have an opinion, but his students would hold multiple opinions. And therefore we find that the Shafi'i corpus is rich of multiple opinions, which makes things easier for the one who wants to follow Imam al-Shafi'i as an Imam or wants to follow the Shafi'i school because he has multiple opinions in front of him, not just one on every issue, but on many issues, multiple opinions, which create flexibility for the one who wants to follow the Shafi'i school. Another thing that we will see as the series goes on, which is a unique feature of the Shafi'i school, is that we have an unbroken chain going from Imam Shafi'i all the way down until the Imams that came in the 6th, 7th, 8th centuries, 9th, even 10th centuries, and further on as well. So we have an unbroken chain going back to Imam Shafi'i from the later part of his school and we will see that as as the course goes along insha'Allah that's also something very unique to the Shafi'i school uh, another thing that's unique to the Shafi'i school is a hallmark of the Shafi'i school is that whenever we want to find out what the Mu'tamad position is in the school it's easy to find it 
the Mu'tamad position of the school is easy to find in the overwhelming majority of issues. And that's largely thanks to people like Imam al-Nawawi who laid down the preponderant opinions for these issues and then they became indisputable after a century or two passed after Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala. So the ease to find Mu'tamad positions. Also, the terminology of the Shafi'i school is very clear. The terminology of the Shafi'i school is very clear, and we'll end with this, inshallah. And this is also largely in thanks to Imam al Nawawi. Inshallah, we'll stop here and we'll continue with the rest in the next lesson. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barik ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allah, 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 Allah,